All right. So, right. Hello, everyone. Welcome. And uh, this is the Friends of San Pedro Valley Parks Lecture Series. I'm Mila Stroganoff. I'm the program director as well as your host and facilitator today for this particular talk. And I'm glad to see that so many of you have decided to join us today. I hope you have your cup of coffee or cup of tea and that you're in for a, and you're in for a lovely uh, time this afternoon and very informative, I would think. Hmm? So um, as a heads up, next month's lecture will be a travel log on Saturday, February the 18th at 3 p.m. with um, J.R. Blair, whom you ought to know quite well. He's done a lot of things for us at, for the friends and he will take us on his very recent trip to Antarctica. Photos and videos will be part of this fascinating experience. So do join us. And I can promise you no huge waves, no seasickness, and no wind. And I'm certain you can't beat that. So today's lecture is being recorded. And I hope that it will be up on the website. Uh, it will be posted in, I hope, in a couple of weeks. And our website, just to remind you, is friends of San Pedro Valley Park.org. And then you just go to lecture recordings and you'll find it. But just give us a bit, a couple of weeks because our IT team is away at present. So please write your questions in QA and comments, if you would be so kind, into chat so they don't get confused and we don't have to check in multiple places for them. Um, our wonderful guest speaker today is Catherine Kildiff, and she is graciously joining us from the East Coast to discuss and educate us about leatherback turtles. Catherine Kildiff is a senior attorney and works in the center's oceans program to protect marine species and ecosystems. Catherine received her law degree from the University of Virginia, a Master of Science from the College of William and Mary's Virginia Institute of Marine Science, and her bachelor's degree in ecology and evolutionary biology from Dartmouth College. Before becoming an attorney, Catherine worked as legislative staff for the U.S. House Resources Committee, Subcommittee on Fisheries, Wildlife, and Oceans. And so, Catherine? Take it away. Thank you so much. Um, so I will share my screen. Um, I'm going to talk today about the endangered leatherback sea turtle and specifically the population that feeds in the spring, summer, and fall off California. Um, and that's because California, the large marine ecosystem, which extends past California into Oregon and Washington, is extremely productive in the summer. There is upwelling of cold, nutrient-rich waters, and these leatherback sea turtles travel thousands of miles to come visit the U.S. West Coast. Um, so it's important that you're aware of them and aware of the threats that they're facing. So I'm gonna introduce myself a little bit more. Um, this is me in the polar bear costume. This is Frostpaw. He, we use Frostpaw to encourage climate action in the US. And I do this work because of my family and um, my daughter, my mom. And it's really important that we all work together to try to keep fossil fuels in the ground. And this is important for leatherback sea turtles as well. And one of the reasons that I love my work is because it's very easy to feel passionate and motivated to save biodiversity. Um, and so I love talking about leatherback sea turtles, but I want to remind everyone that the overarching biggest threat right now is climate change. 
So I'm going to, I divided my talk into three parts. I'm going to go through the biology of these really interesting prehistoric creatures, the threat of plastic pollution, and then the threat of fishing gear. And I'm hoping to leave you with a sense that change is possible um, and that there are victories that are happening, but that it will take all of us being creative and active in order to save these animals from extinction. Uh, because I am a biologist, but I am not an expert in leatherback sea turtles, I'm going to share two different videos with you that will um, allow you to get more familiar with leatherback sea turtles. And these two videos were both produced by the National Marine Fisheries Service, which is in the Department of Commerce, and they have jurisdiction over endangered species. And they also have science departments that do a lot of the important research on them. Um, and so the first one is going to be a little bit fun. So tell me if you cannot hear the audio. Otherwise, this is a video that was produced by the National Marine Sanctuaries, which is um, part of the Department of Commerce about leatherback sea turtles. My name's Andrew, and I'm on the edge of the spectacular Monterey Bay. We're asking people that visit this area from around the world what they know about sea turtles. Catherine, louder, yes. louder. Can you make it louder? Hmm. Let me. Can you you so you can hear it a little bit? It's just yes. not loud enough. Yes. Okay, I can probably work on that. Okay. Think Australia. Is that any better or not better? Uh, more like tropical places. Better. I've never seen those around here. It doesn't like the cold water. Uh, I don't think very much about sea turtles. Southern, south of Mexico, San Diego, warmer waters. They're a different animal. They can survive the different temperatures. I think I believe they swim in the ocean, maybe in ocean currents, and they come up to spot on the beach. I see they nest on beaches. They just crack and hatch, and then the, the little turtles just say, hey, head to the ocean, head to the ocean, because that's where we need to be. A lot of them are kind of scared and don't know what to do. And also the baby turtles, they also get caught by the birds. When they uh, tease their pets, right? They're not mistaken. They eat vegetables, they eat plankton, they eat uh, seaweed. They eat shrimp, too. The feeding on jellyfish is what's not that real. Plenty of them. Other turtles probably eat other baby turtles just because they're a food source. I think the French eat lots of turtles. Humans eat them in different cultures. Who would eat turtles? Who? I don't know. That'd be horrible. They could eat them on wood, really. I think they're protected. So we can't, technically can't eat them or capture them. You know, in the United States technically can't do it. I mean, you know, other countries probably do. They, they take the eggs, do they? I don't know. I don't know. Is it the big, big one, the huge one? Some of them must be what meets are across. Exactly. Uh -huh. What I know from Finding Nemo, they get to be good size. Oh my God, really? That's a leather bag? Mm -hmm. wow. Whoa, big. Dinosaur. Where was that? I think it was cool too, but it's more southern chemistry around the water. It doesn't like the cold. Eight hundred kilograms. Yes, very big. Large and probably quite old, I would guess. That's amazing. And that's out there. Mm -hmm. Right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Gigantic mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. I picture them kicking with both legs coordinated. So 
Just protect them as best we can. And I will definitely do anything in the future to make them less endangered. Okay, so that. <clears throat> was a presentation that they did in October a year ago, which was also when they designated, when the state government designated leatherback sea turtles as a California Endangered Species Act, endangered species. Um, I have one more video, if the sound was good enough to show you. Two things that are unique about leatherback turtles, they are huge animals, they engage in incredible migrations across the Pacific Ocean. These animals are able to maintain a body temperature greater than their environment, which is very unique for reptile. And they do this all on a diet of jellyfish. Truly a magnificent animal. And I think one of the reasons why it doesn't receive more attention is because it's not an animal, it's easily seen. Essentially, hatchlings leave the beach and they're about that big. And when the people see them again at the nesting beach, they are the animals that weigh 1,300 pounds and almost six feet long. Oh, bear with me here for a minute, please. We're here off the central coast of California between Half Moon Bay and San Francisco to learn more about movements of these animals. They're a very cryptic species. They lie very close to the water, not very much is exposed. We're most able to be effective with the help of an aerial team. Uh, okay. Um. Sorry about this. I'm gonna give it one more try and then we'll move on. And they essentially spot the animals for us and direct us to them. When we get on a turtle, it's a, it's a pretty exciting couple of minutes. After the net is put on it, we have it alongside the boat where we secure it with some additional ropes. And this boat is a very unique vessel, like a small landing craft. We have have a lot of nice PVC plating, rubber siding on here to keep the animal protected from hurting itself. We put a transmitter on some of the Okay, well, I think you get the idea. <laughs> so we'll go back. Um, to the presentation. 
Um, Myla, can you confirm that you can still hear me and see me? Yes, I can see you. And okay, good. Okay. The slides. Yes, everything's fine. So the video is good, but I mostly just wanted you to see that the leatherbacks in the water and how the fishery service puts these tags on them while they're off California and they are especially often sighted in Monterey Bay, which I know is fairly close to you. Um, unfortunately, the population has been in decline about 6% a year. And that means that the number that actually come to California is also declining about 58 um, on the annual average of leatherbacks in California is about 58. And so they are nesting all the way in the beaches of Indonesia. They ride a current, the Kuroshio current um, north of the Hawaiian Islands to get to California. And you can see the bottom right graph is the number of leatherbacks foraging off the US West Coast. And it has been declining at a rate that's consistent with the nesting numbers that they gather from Indonesia. So there are about 560 nesting leatherback females, which is how they estimate abundance um, is by counting the females. And of those, um, the males and the females, 58 come to the US West Coast to feed. So they don't come necessarily every year. They cross over to the US West Coast and they'll stay for three to four years um, before going back to the West Coast. And there are probably some areas where they hang out that we don't know about. So it's not certain that all of them come to the US West Coast. Some of them might feed north of the Hawaiian Islands. Um, and so we're still trying to figure out what the life history is of all these animals. They're susceptible not only to getting caught by fishermen off the West Coast, but also fishermen in Hawaii. It's difficult to protect their nests in Indonesia from predators um, like dogs, for example. And there's also many, many fishing fleets that are harvesting fish from the, the international waters that they're swimming through those 7,000 miles. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the threat of plastic. The migratory routes go straight through the Great Pacific garbage patch. And um, so you can see California is on the map on the right with the green circles. Um, and these are tagged leatherbacks. And you can see them traveling straight through where the gyres deposit most of the plastic trash in the ocean. And so this is problematic because the leatherbacks, as you saw in the video, they are feeding on jellyfish. And so a lot of the plastic looks like jellyfish and they're ingesting it. And one of the reasons that they are such good swimmers and they can make it 7,000 miles is because they have very long flippers. And so the flippers are also getting entangled in marine debris. Um, the composition of the plastic trash, the majority of it is from fishing. And so while it's, you know, in our heads, we think of plastic bottle caps and straws and lots of different types of plastic that washes up on the beach. Um, the single category that makes up the majority of the plastic is fishing gear. And there are five industrial nations or nations that have industrial fishing that have been identified as responsible for most of that. And the US is one of those. So 
this is good and bad news because of course we could do something about that. Fishing is highly regulated. Um, and it's, you know, we're putting the fishing gear in the ocean. So there is potentially a solution if we can come up with better practices to make fishing gear not out of plastic, but out of disposable or biodegradable materials as it used to be made out of. I'm sure you're aware of the problem of plastic. Um, the lower right-hand corner is Mr. Udall talking about how much plastic we have in our bodies, which is the amount that's equivalent to a credit card and how the petrochemical industry and the plastic makers are selling their product without being responsible for the harms that are that it's causing. And it's you know it's harming not only leatherback sea turtles, which are huge, they're the size of Volkswagen bugs, but it's also harming very tiny pteropods, such as as pictured in the center picture, which are the base of the food chain. You know, they feed salmon, for example. And so it's really important that we ask the government to systemically change the way that the US uses plastic um, and also internationally come up with a treaty for this. Um, it's not only getting wrapped around the sea turtles, but it's changing the composition of the sand where they lay their nests and the temperature and the moisture content of the sand is really important for sea turtle development. Um, one issue with climate change and our warming world is that the sex of the sea turtle is determined in egg and it's influenced by temperature. So the warmer temperatures mean that there are more males being born or hatching than females. Um, but we don't know the full extent of how the plastic that's in sand is affecting sea turtles, but scientists are worried about it. Um, I mentioned there's a the potential for an international treaty. Last February, the um, United Nations had a meeting where they passed a resolution that said by 2024, there would be a binding commitment on plastic pollution. And this graph you see in the top right, the gray is carbon emissions and the blue is plastic pollution. And they're on two different scales, but you can see that the trend lines are similar, that we're um, emitting more carbon as we're also increasing our plastic production. And yet there have been meaningful climate agreements um, and the plastic pollution agreements have lagged behind, but there is optimism that this United Nations resolution will lead to a binding treaty in 2024. So it's important that we as the public continue to push for that and have the US be a leader. Um, another way that we're addressing this is by bringing lawsuits to stop the permitting of petrochemical complexes. One example of that is in Louisiana in James Parish, there was a company called Formosa that is a known bad actor and has been fined because it makes plastic pellets that are released into the environment. Um, and they were hoping to build a huge new facility to make plastic. And this is especially problematic in the Gulf of Mexico area because that's where a lot of the oil production is. And these facilities are going into areas um, that already have industrial complexes that are affecting public health of the people that live there. And they are transporting the final product through the Gulf of Mexico, which means that sea turtles 
are at risk of being hit by ships. Um, and just the globalization of shipping the plastic and the fossil fuels around the world is really problematic. But we had an, a nice um, win. We filed a lawsuit to challenge the Army Corps permits that would allow Formosa to put this plant in the wetlands and convince the Army Corps to go back and do a full environmental impact statement. So the fight is not yet over, but um, it is at least delayed at this point. And I wanna say that there's a lot of overlap between social injustices where you know, this plant, we were fighting it because it produces plastic, which is bad for endangered species like sea turtles, because that's our mission. But the social injustice arises because these facilities are sited in areas um, that are disproportionately economically disadvantaged. And so the public health impacts are on people that can least protect themselves from the pollution that comes from the facilities. Um, and in this case, there was a subsequent challenge to the air permits from the facility where um, a judge in Louisiana actually recognized that the people that live in this area are descended from slaveholders and they're, um, families, blood, sweat, and tears are in this land. Uh, and so it is not fair for them to be displaced by bad air quality or, um, you know, industrial facilities coming in. And it's a really moving decision. Um, and it's wonderful to read, but it makes me hopeful that not only can these wrongs be corrected to protect the environment, but that it's also going to protect the people that live in harmony with the environment there too. Um, so I'm gonna move on from plastic to the threat of fishing gear. The, um, like I said, fishing gear is a major source of plastic pollution, but it also directly entangles uh, leatherback sea turtles when it's actively fishing. And so this, you can't see very much of the leatherback sea turtle or the fishing gear here, but it's the California Dungeness crab fishing gear, which has a buoy at the surface, which you can see in the picture, the orange, and a large heavy trap at the bottom of the ocean. And so because those long flippers that leatherbacks have, when they're swimming in the area like Monterey Bay, where there's both fishing gear and jellyfish, um, they tend to get wrapped up in the fishing gear. And so one solution that we've been trying to push for is ropeless fishing gear, where the rope is either not deployed until the boat is above the buoy. So it can be released um, remotely by the fisherman and the buoy pops to the surface and then you can pull it up or it can raise a gas canister can release and raise the whole um, pot to the surface and this is also a solution for whale entanglements and it's been developed on the east coast to protect north atlantic right whales and in other fisheries around the world so we're very hopeful that the Dungeness crab fishery and other fisheries on the West Coast that use traps connected to vertical lines to buoys can transition to more sustainable fishing gear. We brought a lawsuit about this problem in 2017 and we were able to settle with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife for a program where they don't open the Dungeness crab fishery until there are no more leatherbacks that they know about on the West Coast. And so that picture at the beginning of the federal scientists putting a tag on the back of the leatherback sea turtle, um, that's really helpful because they do that throughout the summer. And then by the fall, they have a whole bunch of tags and they can see 
whether all their tagged leatherbacks have left. And of course, it's not indicative of the entire abundance on the West Coast. They don't tag every single leatherback, but it at least gives an idea of the dates that the leatherbacks are leaving to go um, to warmer waters over winter. And this is important because of climate change, the migrations of these animals is changing. <clears throat> the warmer water means that they are staying later and they're coming earlier. And so the Dungeness crab fishery, which traditionally opens November 15th, um, was having a big overlap with uh, humpback whales and blue whales and leatherback sea turtles while they were still foraging on the coast. And the Dungeness crab fishery, most 80% of the effort, the fishing effort occurs in the first two weeks. And so the fishery opens and then everyone goes fishing. Um, and that's when you get the best price for the crab. And then later people stop fishing as much. So it's really important when the fishery is delayed, that, that it's delayed to a point where the leatherbacks and the whales are no longer um, in such high concentration. So it was really great that California created this web page, has the risk assessment and mitigation program, and includes an area to close that's important to Pacific leatherbacks. It's not just whale safe fisheries, but it should also be turtles safe fisheries. Another fishing gear is that's a problem on the West Coast are long lines. And the long line fishery, California banned it in 2004. And so those fishing vessels now operate out of Hawaii or outside the 200 mile zone off California. But the federal government is trying to reintroduce long lines off California. And you can see from the picture what it looks like. The lines are set out and then collected many hours later. They're not actively tended. And so they can catch leatherbacks and the leatherbacks drown because they're air breathing and have to come to the surface. Um, and we challenged an exempted fishing permit for two vessels that was issued in 2019 and we were successful in our lawsuit. The exempted fishing permit is um, a test. It's like an experimental fishing permit. Um, and the judge agreed with us that the federal government didn't take into account all the scientists that they employed, the, their own scientists that say every turtle counts to the survival of the species um, when they issued these permits that said, well, we'll stop fishing after we catch or, and kill one endangered sea turtle. And so that was great. Um, it didn't take long line fishing off the table entirely. The federal government still says that they're they want to introduce long lines to California, but it definitely helps to have this decision talking about the importance of leatherback sea turtles. Another bad fishing gear is drift gill nets. Um, drift gill nets are up to a mile long and they entangle whatever comes past, including sharks and sea lions. But fortunately, um, not too many weeks ago, President Biden signed a law that requires a transition program for five years to phase out large scale drift net fishing. And this was something that had passed the House and the Senate, um, but President Trump vetoed it. So it's been in the works for a while, um, but it's pretty exciting that it's finally officially signed. There will be a phase out of this gill net gear we have a pending lawsuit because in 2021, the fishery caught about a dozen humpback whales and they don't have the Endangered Species Act authorizations that they need to, um, to catch humpback whales period or that many humpback whales, which are also listed as endangered. And so we're hoping that there will be Measure interim measures during that five years to reduce the protected species bycatch of turtles and whales um, in those five years. But that's looking, op I'm optimistic about the drift gill net fishery being mitigated too. 
Now, and it's not just, you know, I just identified three types of fishing gear off California that are particularly problematic. Um, of course, the only threats are not those three. And so I wanna talk more about affirmative measures that are in place to protect leatherbacks. This is the orange areas are critical habitat, which is areas that are essential to the conversation, conservation of leatherback sea turtles. And you can see it's not only off California, but it's also <clears throat> off Oregon and Washington. And the critical habitat is very effective at recovering the species because it draws on a map where these animals are and then requires the federal government when they have activities in those areas to consult on whether their activities will adversely affect the animal. Um, and so animals like leatherback sea turtles that have critical habitat designated are twice as likely to be recovering as those that don't. And so this critical habitat was I designated by the federal government in 2012. Um, and then I mentioned this at the beginning, the, we submitted a petition to list the Pacific leatherback sea turtle on the California Endangered Species Act. And that means that California will have to do something similar. Whereas when California is approving a permit or taking an action such as a fishery management plan, developing a fisheries management plan, they will have to undertake um, environmental analysis to make sure that it's not going to harm Pacific leatherback sea turtles. And so one example of this is, I mentioned that the federal government is trying to introduce long lines. Well, the state government is trying to introduce additional crab fisheries. And so they're experimenting with a box crab fishery in Southern California. And they're trying to add experiment with a offshore deep water crab, similar to a deep water crab that they fish for in Alaska off California in the Northern, central to Northern part of California. And so, our position is that we know that this type of fishing gear entangles leatherback sea turtles. And so before they can start this experimental fishing program, they need to go through um, the California Environmental Quality Act process and evaluate whether there needs to be a permit for harming leatherback sea turtles. So I'm very optimistic that both this protection as a state listed endangered species, plus the critical habitat that was designated off California, Washington, Oregon um, in 2012 for the federal, under the Federal Endangered Species Act that all of these things will help protect leatherback sea turtles on the West Coast. Um, and so that's the end of my presentation. I see that we have one Q&A. And then I also wanna say, the YouTube videos of the leatherback sea turtles catching jellyfish are really fun to watch. It's almost like a video game. And so I encourage you to explore that. And leatherback sea turtles aren't only on the West Coast, they're also in the Atlantic and, they're, and they face similar threats of entanglement. Um, and then if you wanna know more about plastic, KQED did a great uh, presentation on why recycling doesn't work and um, how people are individually trying to reduce their plastic use. But I will stop sharing and turn it over to questions. Um, Catherine, do you think you want to try that second video again? And maybe it'll go through? Sounds yes, I will, I'll try. Let me share. Yeah, it, just, it, it just may work, you know? Mm -hmm. And then, let's see. We put a transmitter on some of them to attract their movements across 
not just the Pacific, but look in finer detail to help inform our fisheries about where these animals might be. Huh. Well, let me try one more thing, <laughs> but it's going to require me to leave you. I'm just going to switch my internet um, connection really quick, and then I'm going to rejoin if that's okay. Will that mess you up? No, that will mess Okay. Up. Okay. One second. I'll be right back. relative to different environmental conditions and what kind of depths it might be diving to. We also sample them remotely with a camera that's attached with suction cups. And what this allows us to do is to look at the type of jellies that they're eating. Likewise, those camera devices will also carry a small time depth recorder so we can look at what depth they're actually taking these jellies. One of the things we've learned about this population is that it's actually a meta population. So some of the population is using foraging grounds over in the South China Sea, um, others in the North Pacific, still others migrate off of Australia, New Zealand, as well as those that come all the way across the Pacific here to California. Yet they're all part of the same population. And so we have this incredible connectivity, but in the Pacific Ocean, Leatherback turtles are in really dire straits. The population is declining at about 6% a year. Really, to recover leatherback turtles, we have to be able to provide protection in these other foraging areas as well as what happens here in California. All these people around the Pacific Ocean have a role to play. If we do want to have leatherback turtles with us 40 years from now, it can be turned around but everybody has to play their role in it to have recovery. Okay, good. I'm glad that that worked. So you got a little bit more. I mean, who, who doesn't like to see baby sea turtles crawling through the sand going to the ocean? Exactly. So let's have a look. Thank you so much. Uh, let's have a look and see what we've got. So somebody was asking, what are gyres? Yes, I was debating whether to put a slide about gyres. <laughs> but, um, as the earth spins, um, it creates current. And so there are huge ocean gyres. And so basically in the Pacific Ocean, north of the equator, everything rotates clockwise, essentially. And so, um, and the Hawaiian islands, the Northwestern Hawaiian islands are kind of in the middle. Um, they're counter, I think. Clockwise, counter. You sure they're clockwise? They're not counterclockwise. Well, if you're looking at the map of the Pacific Ocean, huh? the the sea turtles are born in Indonesia. Um, oh yes, so and they ride this Kuroshio current yeah. north okay. to uh, California. Yeah. Um, oh, so the gyres are kind of like an eddy in this big ocean circulation system where all the trash ends up. And it's right around the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands and the, they're like a strainer. And so all this trash just gets caught um, on the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. It's terrible for the albatross that are nesting there and the green sea turtles. Um, oh, but it's also terrible because, you know, these leatherbacks are migrating 7,000 miles through the ocean and have to go through the gyres. So I think I did share that one slide with all their the um, little dots for the leatherback sea turtles going through a heat map, which showed the gyres, which are like just these eddies of trash. Well, you have gyres in every ocean, basically north, north, yes. north northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere, and you have a lot of uh, garbage, pollution, plastic. You name it, collecting in them, right? 
Right, exactly. It's a much higher concentration than other areas of this mm -hmm. huge ocean. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So let's go check and see. And it says, uh, Bill is asking, why is the federal government pushing for long lines? Yes. So this, um, I mentioned that the agency that protects leatherback sea turtles and other endangered species is in the Department of Commerce. <laughs> and so there's the National Marine Fisheries that protects leatherback sea turtles. And then there's the National Marine Fisheries Service that has a mission to promote fishing. And so if there are swordfish in the ocean um, that they're, they're not overfished, the National Marine Fisheries Service has a directive to promote fisheries to go catch them. It's like, a, to, in their minds, a resource that is unused. And so I think this, the, you know, this law that gives them this mission was created decades ago. Um, and it didn't really encompass for the whole ecosystem use. You know, if we're not eating that swordfish, it's not like it just goes to waste. It's part of the ecosystem that's important. But nonetheless, so the federal government is constantly trying to catch more swordfish off California. And they're doing it through either gill nets or long lines. Um, but there is just this month, they put out um, a proposed rule to allow a new type of fishing, which is called buoy gear. And instead of having long lines with hooks hanging down, this is um, a line that is attached to a buoy and it's actively tended by the fishermen. So if the fisherman sees the flag on the buoy waving, then they know that there's a swordfish or a leatherback sea turtle that might be there and they can go and retrieve that the swordfish or release the leatherback sea turtle. Um, and it, so it's not nearly as deadly or indiscriminate as long lines. And so I'm hoping also that if that gear could get approved and fishermen adopt it, um, then leatherback sea turtles and other animals that get caught on long lines, especially like seabirds, won't be at risk. Mm. Are there, you, you work for the Center for Biological Diversity. Is there, are there other organizations that, that work with you in order to, to help the, the, the the situation that you're dealing with, with leatherback or with whales or with, I mean, yes. basically all of the animal life in the oceans is yes. at risk. And, right. and most of these laws that have been written were written decades ago, but they haven't been updated for the, for the loss of biodiversity that's occurring now. And so yes. it's like they're out of sync. And they don't, um... It, they're not really addressing the climate change impacts to the ocean either. <laughs> the resources are changing and are much more limited than they used to be. Um, the other organizations, the long line graphic that I showed was from Pew Environment. They've been really helpful on stopping long lines from coming back to California. And there are organizations that are very good at um, helping fishermen transition to the innovative fishing gear. So Oceana is trying to test both the ropeless fishing gear in the Dungeness crab fishery and also the buoy gear. They were put a lot of effort into promoting the buoy gear that catches swordfish um, in an actively tended manner. So it's not so deadly. So it's interesting because there's a lot of different environmental groups that are all trying to work on different aspects. Um, and we're, because I'm a lawyer, I am working on the lawsuits and stopping permits and getting um, protections under the State Endangered Species Act and the Federal Endangered Species Act. But it takes everybody to raise awareness and put pressure on the government. Mm. Okay, so let's see. Um, well, we know it, it says, could, uh, could you, Sarah's saying, could you talk about the biological role of the leatherback as, as it is a is it different from the other sea turtles like Ridley's or, you know, yeah. there's the hawksbills and other turtles. Have you, have you ever seen a leatherback turtle in person in the wild? I must be a sight to behold if you've seen one. 
I have not seen one, um, but I know people that have seen one from wildlife cruises out of San Francisco. So I would encourage everybody to look for them. <laughs> tell me, tell me when you see one, <laughs> take pictures. Um, <laughs> Because it's it's possible they're out there and people do see them in Monterey Bay and under the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, so I know it's possible. And the yeah, the leatherbacks are really interesting because out of all the sea turtles, they're the only ones that don't have that hard shell. Like uh, if you can picture loggerhead sea turtles, they have the scoots that are go down their back that are. Um, hard and leatherbacks are known, you know, they get their name for their um, back is more cartilaginous and not like a hard uh, shell of most of the other sea turtles, all the other sea turtles. And they are also the evolutionarily oldest sea turtle. And so they've been around you know, since the time of the dinosaurs, which is really cool. And I thought that was, you could see that best from the videos where he's on the deck of the vessel and opening his mouth. Uh, it was just, and they're the size of a Volkswagen bug. So they're also the biggest sea turtle. Yeah. It would be a sight to behold. The only thing I've ever seen is the carapace hanging in the uh, Cal Academy, you know, on the wall. And ever since then, it's like, wow, you know, yeah. that's huge. So, okay, and upward and onward, um, Sharon's asking, does the info you have given related to leatherback population apply to the population in Central America, specifically in Costa Rica? Yeah, that, um, so there is, we often call the, one, the um, Leatherbacks that come to California, the Western Pacific population, but there is an Eastern Pacific population that's even in worse shape, um, more endangered, which is hard to believe. And I, I have scoured the records to try to find situations where they come to California because I'm trying to figure out if they're at risk um, from the same fisheries. And it seems like they, are rarely sighted south of Hawaii, but they haven't really been sighted um, in California, but they are, they mostly stay south. So I hope that answered all her questions. So basically they're in, in the Southern Atlantic, they're in the Caribbean, they're on, they're in, they're on the other side of things. Right? Well, there are, there are Atlantic, leatherbacks that have critical habitat designated in the Caribbean. But uh -huh. in the Pacific, there's also an Eastern Pacific population um, that's just a little bit, that doesn't quite get up to the US, except for Hawaii, might come up south of Hawaii. Ah, okay, all right. So there's- um, There's like two separate populations. Yeah, they have different nesting beaches. So I, uh, when she says, the Central America, I think she might be talking about the ones that nest in Central America and then stay right around the Eastern Pacific mm -hmm. Ocean. Okay. But they have to swim all the way around South America to get to the other side of things, no? I mean, they're not gonna go through the Panama they, Canal. Yeah, no, they, they are separate populations on the Atlantic and the Pacific. So there's more than one distinct population segment in the Pacific in the, Northern Hemisphere, and then there are also ones in the um, Atlantic. Okay, all right, that makes sense. Okay, I wish I had a graphic. It's hard to. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah. that's my finger pointing. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so is there is, is there sexual dimorphism in uh, leatherback sea turtles? Uh, one bigger, the males bigger than the females, or vice versa, and what is the percentage? of hatchlings that survive to maturity. I'd be interested to know how many hatchlings or actual eggs are laid. Are there allowances in Hawaii for artisanal fisheries? Um, so I'm not sure about the sexual dimorphism in leatherback sea turtles. I suspect that it's not easy to tell because- They're just plain uh, 
they're huge and people at least so when i'm thinking about this in terms of our litigation you know it is much worse for populations to kill an adult female than it is to kill an adult male in terms of their reproductive potential and so I, for our lawsuits i've also often tried to figure out if the ones that are being entangled on the west coast are males and fe or females and i haven't been able to come up with those statistics um and then what is the percentage of hashlings that survive to maturity? That's a good question, and I don't know the answer. <clears throat> Anyone, do you know perchance how many eggs are laid by a female? The number of eggs that she may lay in the sand on the beach. Yeah, so I think, um, I'm not totally sure, but my impression that is that they're like in, any given so a female can do multiple clutches in various uh -huh. on various beaches um and in any one clutch there might be 30 eggs but i, I don't know per, the precise statistics so if she lays five clutches in a season it could be 150 eggs um and then are there allowances in hawaii for artisanal fisheries not for leatherback sea turtles because the the leatherbacks are not actually nesting in Hawaii. They're nesting in Indonesia and they're vulnerable to the long lines fishing in Hawaii because those long lines are fishing for swordfish and tunas, um, meaning that they're in the open ocean. They're not really very close to shore. So what I'm trying to say is there aren't very many interactions with artisanal fisheries and leatherbacks. Um, but for other species of turtles, there could, there may be um, allowances. Like I think because green sea turtles actually nest in Hawaii, that there's more interactions, but they're also not endangered. Green sea turtles are threatened. Yeah. So it's not as dire a situation. You've got me with this artisanal. What is it? Artisanal usually means, um, you know, as opposed to industrial fishing. So artisanal won't go as far from shore. Um, they'll use smaller vessels. It won't be um, as big an operation. They won't use long lines, for example. Uh, small, so often. Smaller operations. Yeah. That's not to say that they can't have an impact environmentally, but it. I was trying to make the distinction is they're not gonna have an impact on um, the pelagic or offshore environment that the leatherbacks are using mm. okay well you can see these questions so yes if there's um, something yeah the, do the leatherbacks travel back to the same area every time they migrate yes they do go back to the same nesting beaches and so there are actually population abundances for each nesting beach um, so do they actually go from beach to beach to lay the clutches, the females? So yeah, way, within a, mm -hmm. within a region, within right? A so there, right. There are several different islands. Um, mm. This is an interesting question. Does a lack of leatherbacks create a problem in terms of too many jellyfish having an impact on other marine animals or plants? Um, so one of the great roles of charismatic megafauna, like leatherbacks and whales, is that they are eating at the surface of the ocean, um, and then they're consuming really low on the food chain, like leatherbacks or, you know, the humpback whales are baleen filter feeders, and so they're filtering out zooplankton and phytoplankton. And so when they go poop, their poop acts as nutrients for the entire water column. And then when they die, they sink to the bottom of the ocean and their body decays. And so it helps with the carbon cycle. So they're basically taking um, the carbon at the surface of the water and putting it at the bottom of the ocean or making it more available for other animals like Dungeness crabs. So they do, Leatherback sea turtles do provide 
an important ecosystem service in terms of nutrients and carbon sequestration. Um, and so the International Monetary Fund, IMF, has actually put a number on that carbon sequestration value that whales provide. And I would be surprised if leatherbacks are not in the same category. And so it's frustrating because people are trying to come up with these carbon capture systems, um, especially some of the oil industry. They're trying to figure out how to capture carbon and put it back in the ground. But we could just have our leatherbacks and our whales recover to healthy populations and they would act in the same way and it would be free and we'd get to watch them and have great wildlife. Mm. That would be better. Yeah, so uh, there's a question about international treaties. Yep. And yes, that's another thing that we're not, the US does not import any seafood where it's been caught with gear that is less protective than our fishing gear. So that's good. There are some import restrictions that are designed to protect leatherback sea turtles. Um, and of course, trade is banned in leatherback sea turtles. And is there anything, a one single or any single thing that we can do to help them? I think, real, I mean, y'all are Californians, you vote, um, put pressure on the California government and on the federal government not to introduce long lines and to really transition to whale safe and turtle safe fishing gear. Mm. So some letter writing in, in, in need here. Yes. Mm. And this is, yeah, I mean, this is the there are decisions that are being made about the Dungeness crab fishery um, in the next couple of years that are really influential. Like this is the moment that we can transition to ropeless fishing gear. So it would be great if we did that. Hmm. And, and you were saying that when they do ropeless, they, they actually raise, how do they raise the cat? Yeah, so they, yeah, so the, um, there's two different ways. Either the buoy is restrained at the bottom of the ocean until there's a release triggered by the fishermen up above. So I guess one of the things that makes me optimistic about recovering endangered species is technology. And because the technology is influential in knowing where the turtles are, which means that they can we can close certain areas of the ocean to fishing when they're there. But also you think about how incredible our cell phones are. There's so much more information and we have GPS and we can talk to people easily. And so I'm very optimistic that the technology will become affordable enough for fishermen that they can um, find their traps using technology. They don't actually have to have a buoy sitting at the surface of the ocean to find the trap. And then when they get there, release the buoy or um, inflate the gas inflate a buoy using a gas canister at the bottom to lift the entire trap up. And so it's, you know, now that we can identify where the traps are remotely, it really opens up a lot of possibilities um, in terms of how to retrieve them. Hmm. Well, at least there's hmm. some pro definite progress there. And um, Mike is asking about biologists and whether they can determine which migratory group they belong to. Yeah, that's um, interesting. It has to do a little bit with the technology. They, so I think I mentioned, or maybe um, in one of those slides, the video, they leave the beaches and then some of them just feed north of Hawaii and they don't go all the way to California. And then some of them do go to, all the way to California. So even within this population that all nests in Indonesia, the ones that come to California are special. Um, and different from another migratory group. So biologists can't really determine which migratory group they belong to unless they have a satellite tag on them, which is that device that you saw them gluing to the back of the leatherback, which um, stores data and then transfers it to the satellite and to the biologists. 
So the when they listed the leatherback sea turtle on the Endangered Species Act, they listed it as a worldwide population. Um, and so if they could get, or if there was a policy reason, they could get the genetics and distinguish the different nesting areas from each other, that would give us more information about what's the relevant conservation unit. Mm. But right now they're all endangered. And so the government has decided there's no reason to divide them into smaller populations for the purposes of the Endangered Species Act. Huh. Just lump them together, right. Uh -huh. Protect them all. Yeah. Okay. The, and a lifespan of a, of a leatherback, any idea? No. <laughs> <laughs> They've been um, but I know, I know, I mean, it's I, think it's, yes. <laughs> I think it's hard in the wild to know, you know, how old the oldest are. I know that they are 35 or 40 before they mature. Really? Um, so they have a very late maturity. Which wow. Is, yeah. One of the reasons that they're uh, reproductive potential is low and endangered. You were mentioning the, the gas canisters. And is there any harm that could that they can bring? Um, or that hasn't I, evaluated yet? I don't. I mean, so I guess. I don't, it's not gas as in petroleum, it's a vapor. Um, so I don't think that, I don't know exactly what type of ga gas it is, but I don't think it would, I think they could use something that's not harmful. But I, I'm gonna caveat that, that, I mean, I mentioned that fishing gear is a, the majority of the marine debris in the ocean. And so there is a concern that if you're adding things anything like canisters or more devices to fishing gear that it could increase the amount of gear that is lost. So obviously we don't wanna do that. And that's one of the reasons California is requiring a lot of testing of ropeless gear to make sure that it doesn't increase um, the amount of lost fishing gear. Because right now the crab traps are easily lost because they're attached to these buoys and there's vessels traffic at, you know, San Francisco has tons of huge ships going in and out. Um, and so it, if the line gets cut from the buoy to the trap, then they lose their trap. And also there's huge kelp patties. I mean, I'm sure y'all have seen them in the ocean that when the storms come, all the kelp starts drifting and then that picks up the buoy and carries the trap away. Um, Anyway, so I'm hoping that the technology, if the actual trap has some way of being identified in terms of location, that that will help fishermen be able to retrieve their traps instead of losing them in storms or to vessel traffic. Mm. Well, if it's some sort of hydrogen or helium or something that fills the canister, as long as the containers aren't thrown overboard, we're better off, right? Right. Right. Okay. Makes sense. And Mike is here. I meant oh. when they are born, what determines where they will go? Yes. Back to um, the creation thing. <laughs> so I, I think um, when they're born, how do they know if they're going to go to California or how do they know if they're going to just feed off of Hawaii? And I, it's really, I mean, I, in college, I studied evolutionary biology because evolution is amazing and how, you know, what determines these two different life histories and, um, you know, some turtles are successful, but they're migrating all the way to California. And I don't think we have great answers to that. Obviously, if you're going to a feeding ground that's in Hawaii, that's a lot closer if you're coming from Indonesia than going all the way to California. And so um, the scientists say, it's obvious that once you make the commitment to go to California, it means that the food is much, much better there. Like California, the ecosystem off California is the best place to feed. That's why you have blue whales and humpbacks and leatherback sea turtles and all these awesome huge animals feeding off California because that's like the best restaurant in the Pacific Ocean. Um, but there must be some benefit to just having a shorter migration and fewer spending fewer calories to go off Hawaii and then maybe getting back to the nesting grounds quicker. 
Um, so it's a very complicated equation that I don't think scientists really understand. Hmm. So um, let's see. Uh, Adrian, my husband, who's right next door and the techie expert, yeah. is anyone collecting eggs and later releasing the baby turtles? Because there was a program with the green turtles at various aquariums where they were trying to replenish the populations of green turtles in Hawaii. Are they doing mm -hmm. anything of that nature with, with leatherbacks? I don't know exactly. Um, I would guess that there are, I do know that the National Marine Fisheries Service, you know, talking about in one of the videos, they said, we really need to be helping the leatherback sea turtle in all the different countries and at every life history stage. And our government spends a lot of effort protecting the nesting beaches in Indonesia um, in terms of research and, um, you know, protection from all the threats there. So I would not be surprised, but I don't know. Because I haven't heard anything with regards to that breeding, a breeding program with regards to leatherbacks. I, I think it's tricky when they're, when they're super, super critically endangered. Um, but it's also in a foreign country. So their laws are slightly different, right? So I wouldn't, I don't think that the US government would be capturing them, but I don't know if other governments would be because the US government has to treat them like an endangered species here in the US. And I, I would see a permit um, application go through um, the federal register that's published by the federal government if that were happening, but I just don't know if other governments are doing it. Mm. Okay. Uh, maybe one or two more? You have time? Yes? Yes, I can. Okay. <laughs> but they're getting harder. I feel they're like getting... <laughs> now I'm ahead. <laughs> they're getting harder. Okay, it's time to get away. Um, <laughs> Bill was saying something about a propellant. So probably what they're filling the 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 uh, canisters with it makes it a propellant. It propels the, the, crap the, trap canisters, to the canisters up to the surface. Uh, but the satellite yeah. tags, the satellite tags, how long do they stay on? Um, they stay on and transmit um, information for months, not necessarily years, uh. but sometimes they will fall off and then be recovered. So you can, and they, you can get the information on them. So I wish I knew that like the longest one that had been running, but I would say I ha it's not often that you see multiple years worth of data, but you definitely, if they're put in on the sea turtles in the spring, you know, you get their information well into the fall when they've, um, you know, left California and are hanging out in the South before coming back to California the next year. Right. And then, okay, well, uh, and so the younger ones, I mean, are they going to start migrating, the younger ones? I mean, is that just basically their natural way of, 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 of I mean, they're, when they're young, they start floating with, with sea, you know. Yeah, rats. I think that they, right. I think that they stay uh, more coastal when they're young. Mm -hmm. And then once they get bigger, they can undertake the migrations towards Hawaii and California. Um, and they stay off California for at least about, you know, they're hanging out on the side of the Pacific for at least four years before they go back um, to nest. So we have a chance to recover. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. And then there's something, let's see, there's something here about Trinidad. It says, I witnessed a turtle laying the eggs on a beach in Trinidad, and there were hundreds of them. And then we're told that they hatched very few survived hatchlings. Very few survived because birds and other predators picked them off the beach, which is the norm with turtles. I mean, it's like every other, every predator in sight seems to know right. when, they're, when they're going to have the, you know, deposit the clutches of eggs, right? Yeah. Yeah, right. So I think we we sort of I think it looks 
though, I believe. See, they were getting harder because uh, you were getting better and better in answering them. <laughs> it's dangerous. As you go along, the questions get harder, yes? <laughs> um, I'm going to, I would love to just put in this website because the, the National Marine Sanctuary had an hour long webinar. Um, and I only showed a couple of minutes of it. So maybe I could put it in 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 the in the chat or or yeah. where, or put it on the let's see. Hmm. I don't know. I'm going to um, re <laughs> reply to Mike Painters because I felt like I wasn't answering all of his questions. Did it show up? Well, okay, let me check. Uh, ch uh, chat doesn't seem- Oh, to answered. Nope, that doesn't work. Oh yeah, okay. So under the answered tab, the sanctuaries webinar link. Sanctuaries um, web. Uh, so Mike Painter and the answer. Yeah, the answer to Mike Painter. The answer is to Mike. But I encourage everyone to watch that video, the, the whole video, because they have a 3D representation of the leatherback sea turtle, a virtual reality type thing, which is fun. Okay, one is answered somewhere. Answered, okay, I'll look at answered. Ah, no, I don't see any, okay. Open. There's a little, yeah, arrow under answered. I had to unclaps it to see it. I don't see anything under answered, that's my problem. Oh, sorry. show all, sorry, okay. Okay, so there's, I'll write it down, maybe I can somehow. Okay, folks, so it's HTTPS, Double slash forward two slashes sanctuaries dot n n o a a dot gov slash education slash teachers slash b o n dash voyage dash leatherback dash turtles dot h t m l. So that is the the website you can go to to have uh, uh, an hour program, you said? It's like mm -hmm. a documentary on, on the leatherback. So sanctuaries.noaa.gov forward slash education forward slash teachers forward slash B-O-N dash voyage dash leatherback dash turtles period H-T-M-L. There you go, folks. Great place to go. Highly recommended by Catherine. So, and it will answer all the questions I can. <laughs> and she's kindly answered everything I think that we've got on our uh, had on our on our plate here, you know. And and uh, so, uh, I think it's well, thank you to, to release her <laughs> and and wish her well and thank her sincerely for all her efforts. I mean, you've been most most kind in terms of just giving us all your time plus answering all all of these questions <laughs> i appreciate the discussion all thank right. you all thank you so so much bye -bye. Bye -bye. good night okay bye -bye. thank you bye -bye. Bye, -bye. bye bye or so I'll just we're leaving the web we're closing things up folks so the last ones who are on it's the end of the webinar for today see you next time bye bye <laughs>